Hi, this is Aaron Newcomb, and on this episode of Floss Weekly, Dan Lynch joins me to talk about clockwork. It's a different kind of programming language that's built to control all sorts of machine. You're not going to want to miss it. It's coming up right now on Floss Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Aaron Newcomb and Dan Lynch, episode 263, recorded on September 4th, 2013. Clockwork. Welcome to Floss Weekly. I'm Aaron Newcomb, and I'm filling in today for Randall, who is away. He's on a plane or on a boat or taking a bike ride. I don't know what he's doing, but he's not here. He asked me to fill in. Uh, So we're going to be talking today about good dental hygiene. That's my joke of the day. Sorry. That's what everybody... What are you talking about, Floss Weekly? No, of course, we're talking about open source software and open source software projects, which is really cool. We've got a really great project today. But before we get into that, I want to introduce my co-host, Dan Lynch. Dan, how's it going? Hey, it's good. Good to see you all the way from across the Atlantic here in the UK. Yeah. Well, lucky you. It's not 7.30 in the morning. We're recording a little bit early uh, this morning. So I get the I get the short straw, I guess, <laughs> just because of where, where I'm at in, in, uh, geographically. Uh, it's pretty early for me, but, uh, you know, you've been up all day and, uh, you know, you've had your lunch probably by now, right? You're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 3.30 in the afternoon uh, over here. So um, it works out quite nicely for me. I, I feel a bit sorry for you having to get up at 7.30 uh, to, to get on, online. I'm not sure I could do the show at 7.30 quite as, as well as you seem to be managing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got my coffee and I love open source software. Mm-hmm. I love talking about open source software. So so that gets me going. Anything new in your, you know, it's been a while since uh, I've talked to you. Mm. Is, is there anything new going on? Anything uh, interesting going on in your neck of the woods? Yeah, there's some interesting stuff going on. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, I'll talk a bit more about it at the end, but we've got another OG camp coming up, which is the, the biggest open source event in the UK. Cha-ching, that's our tagline. It's actually true, though. It's not just a tagline. And um, <laughs> Yeah, we've got that coming up in October, so I'm, I'm deep in the middle of trying to organize that, get speakers in place and sponsors and all kinds of other exciting stuff. And then uh, during the day, mostly uh, doing Drupal 7 at the moment, wrangling uh, some sites for people in Drupal 7 and and uh, yeah, banging my head against the wall when it comes to CSS, mostly, I'm afraid. But, oh, uh, I'm ex- I, know, I know exactly what you mean. I still have never <laughs> updated my site. I, I I tried to get it up to Drupal 7, and then I just kind of left it. I was like, forget it. I'm, <laughs> so I know mm. all about the banging your head against the wall. Uh, so so that's great. Well, it's good to be back on with you again. I really, uh, really mm. appreciate you coming on and co-hosting with me. This will be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, it should be great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So speaking of fun, I think we need to get right to our project. So let's bring on uh, Mike and Martin. Mike and Martin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Good. <laughs> hey, and 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 yeah, I think you just gave it away. But where are you speaking to us from this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening? Well, I'm uh, speaking from uh, the Barossa Valley in South Australia, Australia. Uh, it's uh, approximately 12 a.m. in the morning here. Um, wow, that's. From, th- go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm speaking from Queensland where it's always sunny. It's also mm. about one o'clock in the morning. Wow, so you're actually coming to us from tomorrow. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we appreciate you guys staying up late. I mean, I'm getting up early, you're staying up late. Uh, we're all doing our part for open source software today. Uh, <laughs> but you guys uh, are going to be talking about uh, a project called. Uh, clockwork, right? Yeah, that's right. What what is clockwork? Give us kind of the high level. What what is this thing? Oh well, it's a basically a monitoring and control language that we uh, came up with for uh, resolving a few issues with process control and in particular programming in a process sort of control environment. And what does that mean, process control? What is what what are we controlling? We're we controlling hardware. Is it software? What what does it do? Okay. Uh, essentially, what uh, Clockwork does is it, um, it's, it's for controlling um, devices, machinery, equipment. Um, so it uh, looks at the inputs uh, that are available to it, any sensors, any, um, any TCP IP data that's available to it. And um, based on what input it can see, uh, it um, 
determines what state uh, uh, the system, the entire system that it's monitoring is in. And once it, um, once it determines what state it, uh, it's in, it, um, it then takes actions either to get out of that state if, it's, um, if there's a problem or to continue processing something if uh, everything's running well. So open gates, close gates, lift things up, push them down again. So the um, so this is really for is it it's for hardware then right it's for programming programming uh, hardware or I'm thinking like things like on an assembly line or uh, uh, some machine that does a repetitive task and you need to know what state am I in uh, and if I'm in this state then do you know if I'm in X then do Y things like that right that's right an easy example is for example uh, the relationship between a switch and a light. Uh, when the switch is up, you know, you might want the light to be on or you might want it to be off. So the switch is in a state of up and the light is in a state of on. And uh, when you turn the switch to a state of off, you want the light to follow by, um, you want the switch to go down, you want the light to follow by going into an off uh, condition. So it's a very simple process um, sort of logic. Um, but that, that gets very complicated very quickly the more, uh, the more pieces of equipment that you have connected together. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Now, what's your roles in the in the project? Because we didn't get to that yet. What, what uh, for for each of you? What do you guys do? What's your involvement here? Well, uh, um, I'm uh, the sort of the person who asked for the project to be done. Um, I have a, a background in process control and you know, systems administration and those sorts of things, and. Uh, um, I came round to do another project and decided I wasn't going to do the same thing I've always done for the last 15 years and uh, been unhappy with it, you know, um, the standard technology, that logic um, and uh, those sorts of technologies that uh, the industrial world has used for so long that uh, um, was designed so an electrician could program a machine, uh, i.e. somebody with no experience with uh, uh, real programming languages. So um, that's where it came from. Um, Martin will explain uh, uh, where he comes from. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I, I, Mike and I have known each other for some time. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I ran a company that uh, um, worked on a project with Mike in programming uh, some equipment in C++. And um, it took us a lot longer than we expected it to take us. It was, you know, it's very complicated. And when you come down to uh, talking to real-world devices compared to talking to... Um, uh, sort of uh, variables in software. It's quite a different world, you know. You 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 say turn on to, to some device, and a, a programmer will you know put a number into a variable, and then the, the numbers in that variable, and and then you move on. Um, in the real world, you say tell something to turn on, and then you really have to check and wait and uh, see if it has actually come on yet, and uh, and then wait and check again, and then oh, it's turned off again. So when you come to program all of this stuff in C++, the, uh, for example, the, or in any standard language, it becomes complicated. And it's not that you can't do it, it's just that there's a lot of things you have to deal with. And so we, we, we noticed that there's a, um, um, a, a definitely a need to monitor the state of the entire system as well as, as, well as um, uh, tell the system what you want it to do. So I, I, um, I took the opportunity to come up with a language that I... I hope actually makes this a lot easier for people to specify uh, than uh, than it does in something like Python or C or Perl or, or um, other languages that you might choose to use. Yeah. So it sounds like, Martin, you've had some experience uh, with programming already before you got started with this, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I uh, did a computer studies degree uh, many, many years ago, sort of close to 30 years ago, and uh, and I've been programming various things since then, mostly C and C++ and those kind of languages. Um, but uh, as I say, programming in C++ for process control is um, uh, it's quick, but it's complicated. And Mike, what about you? I mean, are you actually? You said that that you're kind of the the user in this case, but do you get it actually? Do you get in and change the code as well, or are you just a user of the software? Oh, yeah, I get in when I can. Um, but mostly, what it comes down to is I'm busy. When we started this, I was busy trying to make the machine work. Uh, finding a bug, um, saying to Martin, hey, this is a bug, and I would work on something else for a while while he worked out you know, what was wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, in that sense, we were able to work together very well um, because uh, I have an intimate understanding of how those sorts of machines should work and how you should control them. Um, and I had a good idea of what I wanted to control in the sense that I didn't want to um, do it the old way 
Um, and, uh, you know, the language that we came up allowed us to sort of draw on a whiteboard a, a set of things we want to do that describe the problem. And the language has a very good uh, connection. So you write it in the language and you sort of go, oh, yeah, I can understand that. That whiteboard and that program actually have some connection, whereas all of the traditional languages we use for those sorts of things um, literally have no connection between the two. You uh, basically have to reinterpret everything that's in front of you uh, and uh, hopefully understand it, you know. Yeah. So so why didn't, I mean, there must be software ex that exists already, right, to do this kind of thing. I mean, why why come up with something new to, to accomplish this? Why doesn't the, what, what is it that you're trying to do that the existing software packages out there don't do? Well, the as I say, the standard language that's used is a thing called Latalogic. Uh, there's also, um, uh, what were the differences? There's, there's an IEEE set of languages that um, are used for industrial control. Um, there's Latalogic, there's uh, structured block diagrams, um, and two more which have, has escaped me right now. Um, they are all either very old, uh, Latalogic is close to 40 years old, um, the, um, the other languages were mostly written by a committee um, and really have no uh, connection to the real world in, you know, as a computer, I did a computer science degree like Martin did. And, you know, we learnt that, you know, you had protected variables and you had functions and all these sorts of things. They almost don't exist in these languages. Today, they're starting to have a few of them, but not massively. Um, and the programming in them, you, when you go to write a new machine, you basically start from scratch. You don't have a library of tools that you can bring to the problem. Um, whereas in this language, you know, I wrote the first program, that took a while, but the second one you know, I did in two weeks. Um, you know, the next one after that was a much bigger program and I got it done in about two weeks. So, you know, it's much more effective for the job. Um, and... I believe, um, more descriptive of what your actual problem um, because you don't have parts of the program spread, spread across the whole uh, program because, as I say, ladder logic in particular, uh, a single point, an I.O. point for, say, a, a cylinder can only be talked about in one point. So if you need to add a new rule to it, you've got to go and find that point and add the rule in. And so that that rule has got no connection to the, re the reason why you added that rule. It's, you know, the reason was somewhere down the bottom of the program. Whereas in our language, we have templates of little machines. Those machines have states. And if you want to reuse them, you um, just instantiate them with the appropriate, um, you know, variables, you know, which are points or flags or other machines, those sorts of things. Mm. So, so Mike, I'm curious to know, um, we've talked a bit about the controlling machines and so on, and uh, I'm curious to know what kind of real-world applications uh, you could give us examples for this. What kind of machines are you controlling? I mean, okay, industrial machines, are we talking production line stuff? Are we talking other things? What kind of stuff are you well, actually uh, doing in the real world? Right right now, we're controlling machines with hydraulics and pneumatics um, okay. and, and electric motors. Uh, the particular application is um, bales of wool. Um, mm. They uh, in Australia, you know, we we shear the sheep, put the bale, <laughs> wool, put the wool in a bale, 180 kilos a pop approximately, and they have mm. to be sampled. And these machines do the sampling. Um, we've done a little machine that uh, reads some scale data, reads the state of uh, a few inputs, and then presents that information via a serial port to a computer. And you mm. know, they were trying to do that manually. We did it automatically, and as a result, got. Uh, the thing to work reliably. That was using a $45 Raspberry Pi. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, you can run it right down at that kind of level. Or, um, And we're in the process right now of looking at a, um, a concrete uh, moulding line. So uh, yeah. they're currently doing it manually. They want to do it automatic automatically. So we'll be doing that. But it's also we did um, uh, a number of things to make it so we could talk to the internet world and those sorts of things. So we implemented um, the Internet of Things uh, protocol, uh, QM, mm -hmm. um, QMTT, 
uh, we imp- implemented a, a, um, a thing we call device connector, which can accept and, re- and make TCP connections, which then has a, a regex way of sucking data in and out of the uh, system. Um, we also talk an industrial protocol called uh, Modbus, which is designed for things like um, uh, human man interface um, uh, devices. Um, what else? Uh, we use Zero MQ, which is a, a project which has been talked about on um, Floss Weekly in the past. Um, mm. uh, very high performance, uh, low latency um, communication protocol. So yeah, that can be used to do a number of uh, uh, integration jobs. Um, what else? What else, Martin? <laughs> um, oh, that's pretty much it. I mean, I think the Internet of Things um, uh, protocols are quite interesting because we can literally take a little Arduino and we, we wrote a little thing called Enquino, which we've also released as open source, which um, uh, you can configure via Internet of Things protocols so that you can tell the Arduino to, to give you status on one of its outputs. And um, this allows you to have one program running in the in a set of Arduinos and then you depending how you plug them into different uh, devices you you um, you then just configure them to say well I make you've got something plugged into digital in you know one two and three and analog in two and four and um, and then uh, tell me about these when they change and uh, uh, the nice thing is that we can point clockwork at something like that and so that over the internet we can monitor this remote device and uh, point clockwork at it and then and then using, using a fairly simple protocol, we can get uh, the clockwork to uh, uh, look at those inputs and turn things on and off through this Arduino interface. So it makes, it should, you know, we're hoping that, that it makes um, programming uh, Internet of Things uh, devices and programming other, um, you know, simple devices much, much simpler than, um, than is, is currently done um, by, you know, by downloading C code to, to these devices and, uh, and then, you know, having custom code on each device and so on. Mm. Uh, that's great. I mean, I, I was going to ask you about interfacing with these devices because um, I'm imagining, you know, a situation as a developer where someone comes along to me and says, "I've got this machine that I don't know paints cars or something, and I want to, yeah, I want to hook it up to the internet and all the rest of it." I'd imagine, it, the, obviously, you've got these industrial standards because that's what I was curious about. How, I mean, you need APIs, you need other things to interface with them. So there are um, there are industry standards that, that you've mentioned that people would, you know, most manufacturers would implement. Have you ever hit a case where you've come across something that's just got no way of kind of interfacing with it or someone? I mean, Martin, I'll throw that one at you as, as the developer, if that's all right. Yep. Well, essentially, uh, from that, from the point of view of what happens in connection to the real world, I I, uh, I follow Mike because, uh, you know, okay. he's, uh, essentially because he's the customer. And so the, the, the things that we have come up with are, um, we've needed, as, as he said, to talk to devices on a serial port. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then we've okay. found that, oh, we have the scales that, that emit uh, information on a, uh, on a TCP IP connection. We've found an a IP camera that in, uh, emits information on a, um, on a TCP IP connection to say that it's, for example, that it's stable. So it keeps mm-hmm. uh, telling you its status, and as soon as it's got a stable image, it lets you know. And, and uh, so we've been, we've been able to connect to those kind of um, things. And for that, we've written a, a little program we call Device Connector that just manages the connection to the real world in these sort of ad hoc sort of uh, systems um, and mm-hmm. translates it into something uh, really using zero and Q um, to send messages to Clockwork to tell it, oh, well, I've received this event, I've got this information for you. Um, so mm-hmm. essentially, uh, we use zero and Q and, um, and Clockwork, uh, Clockwork sends information. Every time one of its devices changes state, it sends a zero and Q message, which means that if you're controlling a piece of machinery, you can quite easily write some monitoring software that just listens to events using uh, zero MQ. And now that's a publish and subscribe idea, so that you essentially mm-hmm. subscribe to a channel, and and as things happen, data comes down that channel, and you just uh, monitor that data. So um, with Clockwork, it's fairly easy to to you know Clockwork will be there doing its thing, but you might want to have a monitoring screen that somebody writes, uh, you know, for example, on a web on a web browser or something like this, where um, you want to see the status of something and you want that in a nice and friendly and custom sort of a style, it's really only a matter of monitoring for these messages. And so, so essentially we've abstracted most of our communications to things like 0MQ. But where there are standards for things like Modbus, and we, we use a thing called EtherCAT, which is a Beckhoff uh, trademark, um, that, that technology provides for incredibly fast um, process control um, 
uh, using um, use, using a you know a very a very sophisticated sort of protocol over Ethernet, and um, so we have a we have a system that implements um, that uses uh, talks to those those devices, um, and um, but a lot of the a lot of the things that somebody you know might use this in the open source sort of world are more like the uh, the hobbyist sort of end of the market, in which case they they'll be looking at mm -hmm. the Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and those kind of things. So. Um, so there, there we use something like Internet of Things protocols. So what we're trying, we'd like to do is implement as many of those um, standard protocols as we can and then provide ways for other people to interface using uh, custom protocols where, that's, um, you know, where, it's, where they need to. Mm. And, and are, there, are there any more uh, standard protocols that you want to uh, get in in future or are they all, have you covered most of those by now? Oh no, there's a lot more. There's a, a lot of techniques. There's a lot of proprietary techniques um, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, Mike, there's a, there's one that we're looking at um, at the moment. This Ethernet o, Ethernet o, o, IP. What was the Ethernet IP? Was yes. Mm. Yeah, it's a that's a um, it's a standard used by um, play, uh, mining type sites. Those sorts of things. Uh, it also can do uh, fairly good motion control. It's called Ethernet slash IP. Um, Uses multicast, those sorts of. Um, it's it needs a lot more infrastructure to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. The big thing for me is that every time I've ever gone to do a project like this, I, either I've had to use you know the industry standard um, PLCs, programmable logic controllers, and written them in ladder logic, and then had the problems of how do I get that information back into a PC, which means I've had to run Windows, I've had to run uh, what's called an OPC server. Um, and you know, and all the problems of trying to maintain that over a fifteen-year period, i.e., impossible, um, and still had problems with it not working properly. Whereas, um, if we can use the simple technologies that have made the internet possible, which are, as we know, quite reliable, really, and easy to adapt to and easy to connect to, then suddenly this whole industrial control world becomes something that anybody can play with um, and with the advent of things like Arduinos and, and uh, you know, we were looking at a Kickstarter for I think, a, I think called, what was it called, Mun? Um, uh, what was that program? Flutter or something or other? Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's an Internet of Things thing for sort of a mesh radio platform that actually works, whereas most of the industry standard mesh radio platforms don't, <laughs> you know. Um, mm. uh, and... Um, then the next problem anybody has that gets into this stuff is, oh, I'm going to have to write in Python a whole lot of infrastructure and then I'm going to have to write the custom program that controls it. Next time they go to do it, probably they restart it from all, all the way from scratch because I'm using a different protocol or it uses a different concept or whatever. It's all very hard. Whereas when you th think about... Um, almost any kind of programming you do, it's, it boils down to states and events. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any, you know, structure statement, you know, uh, switch statements, uh, you know, nested if statements, when you really think about it, they're basically state machines. Um, so what we've done is said we formalise what, what our type of state machine and said you can program anything you want to do where there's a whole lot of information and you want to coalesce that to a particular idea and then as things change, you want to take action against those changes. Um, so changes are including human input where they press a button or flick a switch or temperature changes, all those sorts of things. You know, you could write a, a system for, you know, controlling the temperature of a room or um, turning on and off your solar panels at appropriate times if whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you can do all this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, if you want to be able to translate one pr uh, set of data set, you know, maybe you're getting, say, a solar panel puts out 485 data in some protocol. Well, you can write a simple C program that talks that, dump it into 0MQ, uh, which then Clockwork can look at. It can take actions on it. And at the same time, because it's in 0MQ, you can write a, oh, in fact, we've actually written a, a little sampler that writes it's a disk and gives you a time series data set. So suddenly these things go from being, you know, lots of infrastructure time and then write the program to let's just get it done, you know? Yeah, that, that's, I can see. I mean, obviously, that's a huge advantage in, in any development process. Uh, and 
I'm cu- I'm curious to know how this um, as as a, a you know I, I'm not a I'm not going to say I'm a fantastic developer, but I've worked in a few different languages over the years. Um, how would how would I find this language to use then? What would it be closest to? Would it be like a C plus plus type of thing, or would it be more like Python or so? And how do developers get on with kind of you know getting into Clockwork then? Well, that's a wow. that's a that's actually a very good question. We we don't really know uh, at the moment. Mike is okay. the world expert on Python on um, Clockwork, given that he's really the only person at the moment using okay. it. Okay. Um, uh, so it's very it's very new, and this is the first time we've really uh, done anything particularly public to to tell people that it's that it's there. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's a very unusual language. It's it's much more like um, wiring things on a circuit board than it is standard programming. So, for example, you you'll you'll build a little. We call of all of our classes. Um, so so as a programming term, we refer to things in as cl- uh, you know objects, and and their objects are of different classes. In Clockwork, we use the term machine to refer to things. So we make, we define a machine. And for example, we might define a machine that we might call an AND gate, which in, in electronics is something which t- comes on when both of its two inputs come on. And so mm. that means, for example, you might want to have a doormat and a light switch turning on, you know, both being active at the same time, which means you would actually allow the door to open. I, you know, I don't know why you'd do that. But um, <laughs> so, so, so you... Um, we define a thing called an AND gate, for example, and then uh, and then we just connect the various inputs and various outputs together to make that device function. And and so the you know we define, for example, a, a device that we call a piston. And what happens with a piston is it is it has it, it starts at one end and you turn it on and it moves to the other end and then you, you turn it off again and it moves back to the original point. So it just goes backwards and forwards, you know, as 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 you might expect. Um, so a bicycle pump. And um, mm. uh, so, given that there's a standard piston, pretty much you want to know: is it at one end or, or the other end, or is it somewhere in between? Once you've defined mm. that idea, you can de- define a machine that's called a piston. Then you can work out in your program wherever it is. Now, it doesn't matter whether that piston is a hydraulic or pneumatic or um, rod or device, or if it's something that's hand operated. Uh, from a clockwork point of view, that concept of being a piston is is encapsulated sort of in that idea. And then you just wire that to the various inputs, you know, the sensor that it's at one end or the sensor that says it's at another end or the output mm-hmm. from a timer that says where it is in, the, in between. Um, and so it's very much a, it's a very, very weird language to program. Not, not sort of uh, perhaps comfortable for, for, for programmers who are much happier just leaping into Python and, uh, and, and whipping it out very quickly. But it takes away, for, it takes away a lot of the... Um, uh, the the tricky bits of programming. So that, for example, if you turn an output on, you say set set light to on, um, mm-hmm. that will automatically check for you if the light has, has actually come on yet, and just and you stay locked in that statement until it's actually completed. So that you know that when it's finished executing that statement, that um, mm. that the light has actually come on. So it provides a lot of features that are very make it make it very, very much easier. Mm, it sounds very cool. And and when you were um, I mean originally coming up with this whole thing did you did you look at other languages and think I'll take a bit from that and I'll take a bit from this or where did the kind of design logic come from you know the influences and so on uh, well the, uh, the actually the thing I probably took from I, I, I love uh, Nicholas Wirth's languages so I, I love things like modular 2 and uh, and those kind of things and and the style of this language if you if you look at it uh, has similar um, a similar sort of a layout in that it's uh, got lots of capital letters uh, for where the um, where the reserved words are, um, and um, but apart from that, I've um, I mean I've used a lot of languages over the years, and they all to me there's really not much difference whether you decide to write something in Perl or C or or Python. They they the, those languages are all um, are all very capable of doing um, you know the same jobs, and it's really a matter of personal choice or. Man, you know, mandated rules, but from an organisation or whatever it is that make you choose between those languages. Um, in the case of Clockwork, what we try to do is um, is actually um, define uh, define a model of of machinery uh, at, at, um, and and declare everything in in terms of states. So what we do is we try to force the programmer to consider a machine and and consider understanding what the, what uh, sort of what the machine. Um, how the machine's operating, so that in terms of a light, we say to somebody, how, how would you describe a light? And you know, people would reasonably say, well, a light comes on and it goes off. And that's pretty much it. You know, if it's broken, it won't come on. 
And um, so we have some simple states there. You know, we might have broken, we might have on, and we might have off. Um, a piston, as I said, could be at one end or another end. Um, and so in clockwork, you, do, you sort of build little models of the things that, that you see around you. And because of the, um, because of the way that works, um, you, um, uh, you, I think you, the, the programs are very clear about what, they, what they're manipulating. And in C or, or, or any other language, it's very easy to make a class or a, a, well, not in C, in C++, it's very easy to make a class that, just, that models a particular device but it feels like you're programming in a programming language. It doesn't feel like you're saying, describing what, how a machine is or how it looks or what states it has. And so um, the, the, what, what tends to happen in a, in a programming language is you move from one state to another in, in the case of receiving events, so in terms of your processing. And you're thinking in a very abstract way. And as I said, that causes you to forget that you actually need to look, did the machine actually do what I asked it to do? And uh, so we... Um, by, by taking this other model, we, we're constantly thinking in terms of the machine, what states it has, and verifying that the state that the machine is actually in is what we wanted it to be in. So that, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's much more um, connected to the, um, to the devices themselves. This From my point like... of view, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. I, um, is that um, you describe something, you say... We'll talk about that cylinder, which is it's extended, it's retracted, it's extending, it's retracting. So they're the four states. And with two outputs and two inputs, you can work out where it is. And that piece of code can be reused as many times as you've got pistons on the machine. So in a config file, you're just simply saying, you know, I don't know, loader, um, machine, yeah, you know, is it up? Is it down? Drive it up, drive it down. Colon, and that's your machine. Now um, you can say, is the loader up? I mean, it's got the three states. It's got extended uh, and retracted. So you just simply you know, is when you pass that loader into another machine and say, you know, um, uh, do this when the loader's down. Well, it down is actually retracted. Okay. It's retracted where, um, where we need to be. The other thing that's very good about clockwork is the, one of the hardest things when programming any kind of machine is quite often you don't have access to the real machine until some time in the future. Now, and then when you get the machine, they want to ship it out. So you've got a really short period of time between them being having a complete machine and them wanting to send it out the door. And so clockwork uh, can be programmed to simulate itself, so simulate the machine. So um, the second machine that we wrote, I wouldn't have them access to the machine uh, until sort of two weeks into the future. So I wrote simulations in a config file for all of its actions, its cylinders, its air valves, all those sorts of things, and then wrote my program to those simulations. Um, it took me a fortnight. We went on site. We're there for three days. Um, Monday morning, they were running that machine. I only found one bug in my control, and that was where I hadn't written my simulator well enough for a particular uh, problematic device. Um, so you can imagine, um, you know, even a hobbyist, you know, they're not going to have the hardware until they've finished it. But what they can do is write a simulation for how they believe it's going to work, write all their control code, prove that their control code actually works, and then attach it to the piece of hardware that they've finished off and say, you know, I know my control code's right, so probably my problems are going to be in my control hardware, not in my software. And when you're dealing with hardware and software, one of your biggest problems is, is it my program that's faulty or is it my hardware that's faulty? And this allows to us to overcome that. Whereas in standard, you know, control languages, that's almost impossible. Uh, and in Python and those sorts of things, you'd be in normal programming language, you'd be spending the next X number of weeks just writing your simulation before you'd even get to writing your, your control code. Um, I could literally change from using my simulator to my real hardware in less than an hour, which is what I did. So I just comment, that's all. <laughs> no, that's, that's a beautiful description. I love it. I mean, it really sounds to me more like uh, uh, the Arduino philosophy 
uh, of, uh, you know, the big difference here is really it's, it's about design and not necessarily about getting bogged down in the programming, right? I mean, that was kind of the Arduino, how the Arduino came to be is they wanted to, to provide a simple way for people to control electronics, right? And so the, the language that you use in Arduino, you know, programming the microcontroller, they tried to make it, you know, kind of as simple and as, as straightforward as, as, as possible, um, it does go to a C compiler first, and then then it gets shipped off to to the Arduino. But you know they're trying to provide that interface to say, look, this can be simple, and really think about the the design and what you want to do more than worrying about oh is you know does is this variable you know going to match with this and you know all this stuff that you'd have to worry about if you were getting into you know a a, a Python program or or a, a strict C program or C plus plus program, um, and it seems similar. It seems like this is similar in a way. It, it, in that, if I understand you correctly, you know, you really built this thing to kind of be more of a, uh, to mirror the physical implementation of what you're doing, as opposed to trying to figure out, oh, did I load this library first and then program these variables? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think <laughs> it, it's to be as simple as possible to get to the job of actually doing the complicated thing, and that is controlling machinery. And that's as you know, it's complicated when you think about a building, you know, door locks, and all those sort of things. And it's just as complicated when you're dealing with a real machine. Um, and the normal programming languages, both on the industrial side and on the you know the standard computer science side, just don't fit the problem properly. Yeah. Yeah, and this when I looked at the, the some of the examples that you had on the um, on the homepage, I was I was like, what? I don't because you know, I'm coming at it from like a Perl or a or a Java type you know uh, way of thinking, and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. But what I love about it is is that it really does match. It's like here's what you need to get it done. It's a complete different way of of thinking about things, and so it's really intriguing to me from that aspect. Uh, a couple more questions before we run out of time here. Uh, what do I need to get started in this? Like I, I you know you mentioned. Mentioned Raspberry Pi and Arduino, which is great because I'm a big maker and I, I love both of those projects. I use I've got three Raspberry Pis sitting around here. I've got an Arduino right over here on my desk attached to a breadboard. Um, you know, so so it sounds like you need Linux and you need to build this the software. I don't think I didn't see any packages available no, that you could download for Ubuntu or anything, right? So what what do I how do I just describe to people how if I wanted to get started playing with this? Let's say I've got a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino. I, th I think you could run the code on the Raspberry Pi and then monitor or the Arduino remotely, correct? Okay. Correct. So you would load, um, in the case of a, an Arduino and, say, a Raspberry Pi, you would load our Mquino code onto a Ethernet-ready um, Arduino board. Um, then you would uh, download the code for Clockwork um, onto your Raspberry Pi. Um, you would download the appropriate libraries, either as packages or as source code, depending on... Uh, things. I remember rightly, I actually was able to get all of the code that I needed on the Raspberry Pi without having to compile any of the libraries except for, for possibly the Modbus libraries. Everything else was available as a um, as a package. Uh, then you just simply run the make uh, file with the appropriate command lines and it should just compile. Um, you would use the clockwork make file, not the... Uh, there's another one for... Um, a thing we call IOD, which is actually for the industrial control side of things that talks with EtherCAT. So you just compile the one for Clockwork. Uh, you didn't need to install the um, MQTT server, which is um, the broker for the Internet of Things protocols. Um, and then you would just start to create your config files. Um, and, you know, it should just work. Um, I'm sure that people will unfortunately hit lots of... Um, uh, things that we haven't covered properly both in our documentation and possibly in the compiling uh, because it's such a new project. But, um, you know, with a bit of dedication, they would get it done. Yeah. And what about... Uh uh, if I didn't have an Arduino or something on the other end, would it, it, so it's, I mean, it sounds like this is the sort of thing where I might have a machine that has its own microcontroller um, and, and isn't like set up natively to, 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 to work the way I want it to work. With clockwork, is that um, do you run into that? I know that Dan kind of asked this earlier. I think he was getting at this question. Do you actually have to do programming of of microcontrollers on other devices, maybe non-standard devices, to get it to talk to clockwork? Well, it's really a case of getting it to talk to the Internet of Things, right? So once you can get it to talk to the Internet of Things, then clockwork can then 
communicate with it and make it do its thing. Um, the future of Clockwork, of course, is to uh, have it create C code, which, uh, which could be compiled onto hardware, although you'd still need some sort of uh, compatibility layer to make it work on a, a bare metal type device. Um, but, you know, that would be possible. Um, so it's more about getting into Clockwork. And so, as I say, there's a number of ways that can be done. Um, you know, with the device connector program, uh, if you're just getting a stream of data from another device or um, the you know, QMTT, MQTT, um, or, um, you know, a serial port, um, or you could be using, of course, uh, programs you might have written in Python or Perl or whatever to extract data from some other source. So one of the things we've been contemplating is that you don't actually need to use clockwork for actual in control. It could be used for business logic or, um, or uh, information gathering from other sources which you then want to take action on. Um, and where you do that, you would have to write some sort of custom thing to actually get the data. But once it's, you've got the data and you can punch it into, uh, into Zero MQ, then Clockwork could look at it and, and do processing on it and, and emit uh, commands or, or whatever that might need be needed for that particular job. Yeah. Um, does, uh, a couple other quick questions. Is uh, anyone ever get this mixed up with clockwork mod? There's a, in, in Android, there's a, uh, you know, clockwork. I wondered that. <laughs> yeah, set of programs. Has anyone ever come to you and say, what the heck? You guys aren't clockwork. I'm used to running clockwork on my Android phone. I hadn't heard of it. <laughs> okay. okay. Like, yeah. I guess that yeah. answers that question. Uh, so a couple other quick questions too. I noticed that on your um, uh, on the GitHub page, you mentioned that you're f Shuttleworth funded. Is that what's the link there? You, you actually have some funding from the Shuttleworth Foundation. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, we were given a uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the of the, very, the, sh the short uh, the small small grants that they um, uh, give out, which is. Um, and that that grant is really to help us with our documentation, which is sadly, um, you know, needing a lot of work still. Um, and also, uh, we're trying to at the moment get uh, Clockwork to compile. It's interpreted at the moment, and uh, it's it runs at um, in terms of our um, process control uh, industrial sort of uh, work with EtherCAT. We we only can manage um, 500 to 1,000 cycles per second in terms of sampling of the the state of the entire machine in that in you know about a thousand times a second. And uh, that's quick enough for a lot of a lot of work, but it's not it's not as quick as we need it want to, it to be. But also, we, we really would like to be able to um, factor a program into pieces that some of which are embedded onto um, actual um, in, uh, microcontrollers. And for that, we need to compile seg uh, segments of, of Clockwork and be able to distribute those to different pieces of hardware through through a network, so that different parts of the system do different things. Um, and then send each other events. So, so there's a lot of work to do, and uh, the Shuttleworth Foundation has given us um, a, a grant to, you know, to do some work towards um, towards those things. Yeah. So, so that's a great lead into my next question, which is, what do you need help from anyone in working on this? Is it? Uh, I, I'm assuming that basically it's just you two at this point working on this. Or and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and if that's the case, what kind of help are you looking for from people that might be interested and want to jump in? Oh well, we, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. At, the, at the moment, we've got uh, there's a lot of things in the language that we've we've actually written a sort of a futures document which outlines some of the ideas for what the language needs to be able to uh, do. Um, we need a lot of work with interfacing, as I think you both mentioned. Uh, we, you know, there's there's at the moment quite a limitation in terms of what we can easily connect to and and so on. Um, the program the program interpreter itself. Um, is kind of written on the fly while we were designing the language, and so ultimately it needs to be um, probably discarded and re rewritten now that we have a better understanding of the, the way that the language um, uh, needs to operate. Um, uh, so there's a lot of things. Uh, the documentation, as I said, uh, uh, so um, and um, you know I'm a generalist. I'm not a I'm not a language designer, uh, and so on. So there's probably several things when we look uh, critically at the design of the language, we can probably find many. Situations where the language is um, poorly defined, or, or um, uh, and so on. So, 
So pretty much any aspect of of the um, the language itself. What what I find interesting about it is that it is quite an unusual way to program, based on my experience. So it's not a functional language. It's not a um, it's not a, a a normal sort of third generation language. Um, so from that point of view, from a computer science point of view, it's it feels like it's kind of interesting and a little bit a little bit newish. Yeah. And and um, it seems like it'd be a really good project actually for someone doing a because it's so different um, from the way you would normally do things. It seems like it'd be a really good project actually for you know someone working on a master, like a master's program in computer science or something like that to really pick up and say, hey, here's a completely different way, or not completely different, but you know a different way than we're used to you know designing programming languages. And uh, so if there's any uh, you know PhD candidates out there or people working on their, their master's degree in computer science, this might be a good project to get involved with, I think, anyway. Uh, what uh, license do you guys use? At the it's moment, we uh, yeah, GNU uh, GPL uh, 2 or 3, I'm not sure which it is. Um, so, we, um, I, I'd like to issue it under a BSD as well, um, but at the moment it's under GPL. Okay, and then, of course, you're using uh, various other components. I think are, are all the other components, uh, do you know, are they all GPL compatible as well? I'm, I'm guessing they must be, right? Yeah, as far as we know. <laughs> yeah, we had to do uh, one of the, one of the libraries, the EtherCAT library, is GPL, and because we were working with that intimately at the time, uh, we felt we had to release it under the GPL, even though we were actually wanting to do it under a BSD type license. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the EtherCAT um, wasn't being used, um, which is you know very much about true industrial control, which I suspect a lot of users would not use this system for uh, in the general world, except that uh, anybody working with robots or anything like that, well then EtherCAT's the language because it can, um, or system, because it can do very high speed updates uh, at very high accuracy levels, um, which there's not many who can do that. Um, but uh, yeah, GPL um, yeah, is uh, good. the current license and all the things. Good, good. Well, it certainly seems to be built for speed, like you mentioned, which I imagine could be quite important if you're talking to a lot of different moving pieces. You need to know exactly where what they are, where they're at, and what they're doing, probably at any given time. And so, the speed, I'm sure, is one of the critical factors here. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you, just to wrap up. We're out of time, unfortunately, but um, there's two questions that Randall always likes to ask, and so you know, I, I try to be a good a good uh, uh, host in his place and ask these questions at the end of any interview. So, the first one is, uh, what's your favorite language? Do you have a Language of preference. Um, I, I like to, I like to use literate programming, so I guess uh, tech is probably my, my favorite language. <laughs> um, normally, I thought the question was actually favorite scripting language. I would normally use Bash or PHP, but um, mm. uh, programming language. Um, uh, I use so many, I don't have a preference other than uh, <laughs> clockwork seems to be a very good way of doing a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would expect That's you good. to say, but <laughs> it's not always, you know, it's not, it's not always the case. And I usually like to make it a little bit broader. I know Randall usually says scripting language, but, you know, everyone has their, has their own, uh, picks their own poison. So I like to throw it open and see what people can come up with. It's kind of interesting. And of course, what's your favorite editor? Do you guys have a preference for, for an editor? I always use VI. I hate it, but I use it. <laughs> and I use VI. Nice. Uh, okay. You guys are on the same page. Randall won't like that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I like it. I use VI quite frequently, although less and less these days. I seem to be using uh, uh, more, uh, when, when the GUI is available, I seem to be using more GUI tools for, for editing just so that it's a little bit, a little bit easier for me to do some, you know, uh, I'll get the line numbers on the side and see it visually a, a little bit more visually than VI. But VI is my go-to editor as well whenever I need to get something done quickly. So great. Any last things that we didn't ask you that you want to point out for people? Where should they go to find out more information? Well, certainly the um, lower third has the um, the um, GitHub uh, URL. Um, we welcome any uh, body um, trying to use the language or wanting to improve it or work with us. Um, anybody that has a project that they they want to have a look at, we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, and, you know, we just want people to come and have a look at it and um, 
tell us what we've done wrong, wrong what, what have we done right, and uh, that kind of thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Martin, how about you? Any last thoughts? Uh, no, just to say thank you really for uh, having us here and talking uh, with us about this, and um, hopefully somebody that's interested in uh, this kind of developments would be interested in uh, coming on board and helping us out a little as well. So thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, we hope that people get, in jo uh, get involved with it. And thanks for staying up late and talking with us. No Thank you. All right. So that was clockwork. And in case you're listening and you can't see that lower third, the, uh, the URL is latproc.github.io. That's L-A-T-P-R-O-C.github.io slash clockwork. And that's clockwork. So Dan, what do you think about clockwork? It's, it sounds fascinating. It sounds very, very uh, interesting. I, I've got a lot of uh, friends who are involved in uh, IoT, Internet of Things. A couple of them are actually writing uh, a book about it right now um, for one of the major publishers. And uh, they, I don't. It sounds as though these, this hasn't really been exposed to the world before. So it's almost an exclusive. It's probably not an exclusive, but I'm going to claim that anyway. Um, but it sounds really good, and I think lots of people I know could could use this. Um, I, I, I mean, you're involved in the maker world, uh, maker world, and some maker fair and all that kind of stuff. And um, it sounds like it could be really useful in saving time for modeling, you know, physical machines, which is what the whole thing's designed for, which is, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And I really love the fact that this is, uh, you know, kind of a, just a different approach, right? I mean, sometimes we get so mm. stuck in the, in the paradigms that we live in, right? It's like, it's like, well, it has to be this way and you have to have, you know, these, these types of things or else it's not really, you know, a programming language or I'm not going to understand it. I love the fact that they attack this from a different angle and they're just like, hey, you know, this needs to correlate a little bit better to the physical problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, mm. And so we're actually going to structure the language this way. And, you know, so it may be a little bit easier once you once you pick once you get over the hump, so to speak. It, it may be a little bit easier to figure out what's going on and and to to make it work logically as well as it pertains to the physical environment too. So it's really a different way, and I think it really is in line with kind of the Arduino philosophy of trying to get the programming out of the way so that people can just you know go on and 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 and, and create cool things, right? Let's not worry about the programming so much. Let's let's make those LEDs blink, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we didn't get into it, but there are some code examples and things on, on the website. And uh, it looks as though in a fairly small amount of lines, say 10 to 20 lines of code, you can define a, a basic machine and, and start to get it doing things, which is which is brilliant. So um, if you want to check those out, uh, by all means, check the website, because uh, we didn't quite get into those. We probably could have talked longer, but it seems like a fascinating subject. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, speaking about fascinating subjects, uh, <laughs> I guess we need to talk about uh, what's coming up uh, next for Floss Weekly. I know that Randall's been really busy uh, scheduling um, shows. I mean, I think he's out till, what is it, Dan? He's out till it's the middle of October or something like that? A while, yeah. I don't know the exact date. It's certainly a while. So, let's see. Where are we today? Today is the 4th. Uh, and we're on. So next week, I believe you're going to be back, Dan, uh, talking about Campfire Manager. Um, I, am. I, I don't know if you know much about that. I, I don't. I've never heard of Campfire Manager. Yeah, I, I know quite. I won't go on about it too much now to uh, pre, not to preempt next week. But um, yeah, I know a lot about this project. The uh, the main developer is a friend of mine, and he actually developed the project for Og Camp, which is the uh, event that we run in the UK. So um, I'm, I'm very much involved in this. I'm kind of straddling the line between guest and host, I think, next week, possibly. <laughs> that should be fun. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Now it makes sense. I was like, wow, why would I want a campfire? Man? Now it makes complete sense. So I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> uh, and then the week after that, we're going to be talking on the 18th. I'll be back co-hosting with Randall. We're going to be talking about OpenWRT, which is, uh, you may have heard of DDWRT, or this is basically you know custom code. Speaking of code to run things, this is custom code that you can put on your router uh, at home, and it'll actually... Uh, you, it expands the functionality in many cases of the of the code, the native code that's running from the manufacturer. So I uh, take a little risk there by by putting on someone else's code. But hey, we're Linux geeks. We're used to doing this all the time. It's not a big deal. So we're going to be talking about that. And then uh, coming up on the 25th of September, uh, Zone Minder uh, is coming up. And then on October 2nd, we have, I'm not sure how to say this one, actually, Yasi or it's Y-A-C-Y. 
uh, .net is the URL mm-hmm. for that one. That's coming up on October 2nd. Um, again, something I'm not familiar with, but this is, uh, uh, man, there's so many good topics coming up. Um, if you like open source software, you're going to want to stay tuned. It's pretty cool. So before we wrap up, Dan, why don't you tell everybody you know, where they can find you and, and uh, where they should follow you and all that good stuff. Yeah, and, and I, I just going to mention very quickly that I'm using a, a, a Linksys router right now with DDWRT on it, so I can't wait to hear the, the OpenWRT uh, uh, show to hear more about that. Um, if you want to find what I'm up to, um, you can find me. It says in the lower third there, it's danlynch.org is the address, which is my blog and other things. Uh, links to uh, Twitter and Facebook and all those kind of places, Google+, Plus, of course. Um, and uh, don't forget to check out OGCAMP, which is O-G-G-C-A-M-P. You're going to hear more about that next week, I imagine. Uh, and uh, that's that's a it's an open source event. It's a kind of a hybrid between a bar camp and a scheduled uh, conference. So we have one scheduled track, and then we have three bar camp tracks um, managed by our lovely Campfire software, which we'll talk about. And uh, it's free to it's free to attend. Uh, if you head to ogcamp.org, O-G-G-C-A-M-P, I can't spell, .org, uh, you can find out more there and you can get tickets. It's in Liverpool in the UK. It's on the ni- uh, 20th, sorry, 19th and 20th, I'll get this right in a minute, of October. So it's coming up fairly soon. Um, so go and have a look there and uh, find out more. Oh, that's great. I wish I could come over and join you guys. That, that sounds awesome. Every time it comes up, uh, I always get a little jealous that I can't somehow... <laughs> A range of business trip or something, you know, and get over there for that. I'd love to, but uh, it's a little yeah. far away. It takes a while to get to uh, if you're not uh, if you're not uh, flying already. So, uh, so good luck with that. I think that's I think it's great that you guys are doing that. Uh, as yeah, far as I am concerned, uh, you can follow me on Google Plus. That's the best way to follow me. I am. Uh, uh, Aaron Newcomb, or just search for Aaron Newcomb. You'll find me on Google+. Plus. Add me to your circles there for sure. I like to talk about Android. I like to talk about open source, as you might imagine, um, and uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, anime, board games, uh, anything uh, Star Wars or Star Trek related. You'll see all kinds of stuff on there. So definitely follow me there. Or you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter, too. I'm there as well. So whatever your poison is, just pick it and go with it. Um, also, you can follow this show. We're at Floss Weekly on Twitter. Uh, also on Google Plus. We have a Google Plus page called Floss Weekly. You can find that very easily. Um, and you can join us live on the chat stream at uh, uh, irc.twit.tv or watch live at live.twit.tv um, and, uh, or just download it and listen to it at your leisure. That's what we're here for. So thanks for joining us today and we'll see you next time on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.